In the last lecture, we began to see why some scholars have questioned the historical accuracy of the New Testament Gospels. These Gospels were anonymous works written decades after Jesus' life. And the later Gospels appear to portray him along the lines of a divine being, like Apollonius of Tiana, or others of those in the ancient world who were thought to be divinely born and divinely empowered to do miracles. At the end of the lecture, I asked whether it's possible that the later Gospels represent modifications of Jesus as he really was, whether Christians in later times, including the authors of the Gospels, began to see him as in some sense divine, whereas in the earlier periods, including during Jesus' own life, he was not seen that way. Let me stress once again that I'm not talking about the importance of the Gospels for issues of faith, only about their importance for knowing what Jesus himself was really like. Whether what he was really like should affect what you believe about him is a different question, one that various theologians and biblical scholars answer differently. At this stage, though, I'm more interested in the prior question, not what to believe about Jesus, but how to know what he actually said and did. The obvious place to start is with a fuller understanding of our earliest sources for knowing about Jesus, the Gospels of the New Testament. In this lecture, we'll consider these books in general terms. What kind of documents are they? Historically accurate biographies, fairy tales, written accounts of early Christian legends and myths, something else. To proceed, I'd like to give a very brief history of scholarship on this question of what the Gospels are. In doing so, I'll discuss three different ways of thinking about the Gospels. I'm going to set up the discussion as a kind of chronological survey, in other words, looking at, at how scholars have thought about the Gospels in different time periods of modern scholarship. But even though I'm setting it up that way, I should emphasize that all three understandings of the Gospels are still represented by some readers today. And so three periods of Gospel research. First, before the European Enlightenment of the 18th century, virtually everyone understood the Gospels of the New Testament to be supernatural histories. The Gospels were supernatural histories. Both of these terms are important. The Gospels were believed to record historical events, things that actually happened. They were histories. But these events were by and large supernatural. And so they're supernatural histories. It'll help to understand the view some and to explain the subsequent views by giving several examples. I'll give three examples of how this view happened to work. First, in all four of our Gospels, there's an account of Jesus miraculously feeding the multitudes. Uh, found in all four Gospels, the account works like this. There are, uh, there are Jesus and his disciples with a crowd of followers. The crowds have been with Jesus, hearing him teach for a long time. The disciples come up to Jesus, and they say that uh, the crowds are hungry. Dismiss them so they can go buy food. Jesus says to his disciples, well, why don't you provide food for them? Well, how can we possibly provide food for this multitude? Jesus says, how much food do you have? They count it up. They have five loaves and two fishes. Jesus directs the disciples then to have the crowds sit in groups of uh, 50 people each. Uh, the text tells us that there were 5,000 men present at this event, not counting the women and children, and so say something like 12,000 people or so uh, present. The uh, people all sit then in groups, and Jesus takes the loaves and the fish and begins to divide them, giving them to the disciples, who then give them to the people who are seated in the groups. And a miracle happens. Soon there's enough for everybody, so that in fact 
there are basketfuls of food left over. The miraculous feeding of the multitudes. Those who understand the Gospels as supernatural histories see this as a miraculous event, something that actually had happened. Jesus, through the use of his divine power, multiplied a few loaves of bread to feed the, the, the thousands who had gathered to hear him teach. Second example, Jesus walking on the water. Jesus walking on the water is a, a miracle found in three of our Gospels. Again, it's a familiar account. Jesus dismisses the crowds and tells his disciples to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee in their boat, uh, and they then proceed to begin rowing. Uh, he stays on land to pray, and he'll catch up with them later. It's night, and while they're rowing, a storm comes up, and uh, they're rowing against the waves and not making much headway in the middle of the sea, uh, which is actually, if you've been to, uh, to Israel, you know it's really more like a, a lake, a large lake. Jesus, uh, after praying on land, sees that the disciples are not making headway and decides then to walk out to them. And uh, in the midst of the storm, he begins to walk on the water. The disciples then see him and are terrified. They think that it must be a ghost. Jesus says, don't be afraid, it is I. Simon Peter, uh, according to Matthew's gospel, who is always uh, saying and doing uh, peculiar things, says, Lord, uh, if it's you, let me come to you. Uh, Jesus says, come. And Peter then hops out of the boat and starts walking to Jesus, but then he looks around and he realizes what he's doing and becomes terrified and he begins to sink. Jesus reaches out his hand and says, oh, you've little faith. He pulls him up, and they both get into the boat, and the boat then arrives at its destination. Those who understand the Gospels to be supernatural histories maintain that this is a miraculous event that had actually happened. People, uh, Jesus actually did walk on the water, as did Simon and Peter, as did Simon Peter. In fact, this is something that if you had been there, you would have, you would have been able to see it happen. Third example, consider the biggest miracle of all, the resurrection of Jesus. According to the accounts, after being dead and buried, Jesus on the third day is raised by God from the dead. He then appears to his disciples as the Lord of life. Jesus was really dead, really buried, really raised from the dead, Anybody who had been present in Jerusalem at the time could have seen it happen. Uh, those who believe then in the Gospels of Supernatural Histories believe that the bodily resurrection of Jesus was a real, historical, literal event. This then is the first way of understanding the Gospels as supernatural histories, the way of understanding the Gospels that virtually everybody who looked at the Gospels prior to the 18th century Enlightenment, uh, that's the way virtually everybody understood the Gospels at the time. Starting with the Enlightenment, some scholars started seeing the Gospels in a different way. Enlightenment scholars began looking at the Gospels not as supernatural histories, but as natural histories. The Enlightenment that swept through Europe in the 18th century involved a whole new way of thinking and looking at the world. Intellectuals of the Enlightenment had come to distrust traditional sources of authority and started to insist on the power of human reason to understand the world and the human's place in it. This was an age of science and the development of modern technology. Scholars began to assert the logic and importance of cause-effect relationships. They developed scientific notions of natural law, that is, highly predictable ways that nature worked, along with the concomitant view that these laws could not be broken by any outside agency for example, by a divine being. These intellectuals modified the grounds of human knowledge, away, for example, from the traditional teachings and dogmas of the church to such 
objective processes as rational observation, empirical verification, and logical inference. In terms of religious belief, scholars of the Enlightenment recognized that in earlier times, people had appealed to divine agency to explain natural phenomena that seemed mysterious and beyond the ken of normal human experience. But they themselves, as men of the Enlightenment, realized how naive and ignorant these earlier people had been, mistaking natural events uh, for activities of God or the gods. A number of biblical scholars were heavily influenced by the Enlightenment and took, therefore, a rationalistic view of the Gospels, trying to understand uh, the Gospels through the processes of human reason, assuming that the miraculous events described in them couldn't really have happened, since we know that miracles don't happen, but trying to understand then what really did happen. According to these, go these scholars, the miracles of the Bible themselves didn't happen as miracles. Thus, even though the ancients thought that they saw miracles, for example, when lightning struck or when a sick child was returned to health, they simply didn't understand the true nature of cause and effect. People of enlightenment, though, began to understand how weather patterns worked. They began to understand how the body, body's uh, natural defenses take over. For such scholars, the Gospels, therefore, do not contain historical accounts of actual supernatural events. They instead recount natural histories, historical events that were completely natural but that were misinterpreted or misperceived to be miraculous. How does it work? One of the famous rationalist interpreters of the Bible was a German theologian named Heinrich Paulus, who was the author of a famous study, Das Leben Jesu, uh, which is uh, translated The Life of Jesus, published in 1827. Paulus scrutinized gospel accounts to determine what really happened during Jesus' life that his followers misconstrued in terms of the supernatural. Take the three examples we've looked at. The so-called feeding of the multitudes. Well, what really happened that was misperceived to be a miracle? According to Paulus, what happened is Jesus has been teaching the crowds, thousands of people there. Jesus directs them to sit in little groups. Uh, the disciples uh, say, well, how are we to feed such people? And Jesus, how, many, how much food do you have? Well, we have five loaves and two fish. Let me have them. They bring them to Jesus. Jesus begins breaking the loaves and the fish. Everybody else who's observed what Jesus is doing then, sitting in these groups, realizes, oh, it's lunchtime. They all break out their own lunch baskets, and they begin sharing with one another. And pretty soon there's enough to go around for everybody so that there's basketfuls of food left over. There's no miracle here. There's simply a natural event that somebody at a later time interpreted to be a miraculous occurrence. Take the second event, the account of Jesus walking on the water. Well, what really happened in this event? Paulus observes that the event took place at night when it was dark. A storm had come up. The disciples are rowing against the wind and not making any progress. In fact, according to Pallas, they made no progress at all. They don't realize where they are. They think they're in the middle of the lake because they've been rowing for a while, but in fact, they've never gotten off the shore. Jesus, realizing what's going on, begins to walk to them, wading through the water. The disciples, thinking they're in the middle of the lake, are astounded. They're terrified. It's a ghost. No, it's not a ghost. It's just me. Lord, if it's you, let me come to you, says Simon Peter. Jesus says, fine. So Simon gets out, starts floundering around the water, thinking that he's in the middle of the lake. Jesus pulls him up. What's the problem? They both get in the boat, and there they are on land. There's not a miracle here. There's a misperception that the disciples have occasioned by the dark and the storm. This relates not a supernatural event, but a natural event. Well, okay, you can describe miracles like that, but what does one do with the biggest miracle of all, the resurrection of Jesus? After all, Jesus was crucified, he died, and he was buried. Or did he die? Paulus observes 
that the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, whom we will be meeting later in this course, mentions two of his own companions who survived crucifixion. Josephus was a, uh, a translator by the Romans during the Jewish War that we'll talk about. Two uh, people were being crucified, and Josephus used his influence to have the Romans take them off the cross. Uh, they survived. One of them actually lived, uh, lived a long time afterwards. What does this have to do with the account of Jesus? Well, Jesus was flogged within an inch of his life and then was crucified, according to the Gospel accounts. What Pallas maintains happened was that on the cross... Already having suffered such pain, Jesus' vital signs slowed down, his breathing slowed. They thought that, in fact, he had died when he had not. The Roman soldiers took him off the cross, put him in a tomb, and in the cool of the tomb with the smell of the unguents, Jesus awoke and then left the tomb and appeared to his disciples, who naturally believed that he had been raised from the dead. In fact, he hadn't been raised from the dead. He had never died. Paulus's explanation for the miracles of the Gospels may seem fairly outlandish to us today. But for many people of the Enlightenment, they made a lot of sense. At least they made a lot better sense than the belief in miracles which aren't merely implausible the way the palace's explanations might be. Miracles are impossible. And so an implausible understanding is better than an impossible one for many people of the Enlightenment. So far we've seen two of the ways of looking at the Gospels. The Gospels as supernatural histories and the Gospels as natural histories. A major shift in the way of looking at the Gospels came in the years 1835 and 36 with the publication of a two-volume book called, in English translation, The Life of Jesus Critically Examined by the famous German theologian David Friedrich Strauss. This was an erudite and compelling book. Nearly 1,500 pages of detailed and meticulous argumentation involving every story in the Gospels. It was a, uh, (coughs) it was an earth-shattering book in a lot of ways. One of the most striking things about it, uh, in view of its massive detailed argumentation and erudition, is that Strauss wrote it when he was 29. Uh, It was translated, by the way, by uh, none other than George Eliot, uh, also known as Marianne Evans. Before she was George Eliot, uh, this was uh, George Eliot's first literary endeavor, translating Strauss's uh, Life of Jesus into English before she wrote her first novel. <laughs> she she uh, did this when she was 27. Uh, they seem to have made scholars younger in those days. The Life of Jesus, critically examined by David Friedrich Strauss, disagreed with both of the prevailing ways of understanding the Gospels at the time. On the one hand, Strauss agreed with the rationalists who said that miracles don't happen, and that as a result, the Gospels can't be literally true in their depictions. But on the other hand, he found the enlightened, natural explanations of the gospel narratives ludicrous and thought that rationalists like Pallas were completely off base in thinking that the miracle stories represented historical events that were simply misunderstood by Jesus' pre-enlightened followers. For Strauss, the gospels contain neither supernatural histories nor natural histories. Instead, The Gospels contain myths. It's important not to write Strauss off before understanding what he means by this assertion, that the Gospels are not histories but myths. Because, in fact, Strauss did not mean by the term myth what most people today mean by the term. Today, most people understand a myth to be a story that isn't true. For Strauss, it was just the opposite. 
A myth was true, but it didn't happen. A myth was true, but it didn't happen. Well, how could that be? More precisely for Strauss, a myth is a history-like story that is meant to convey a religious truth. That is, the story itself is fictional, even though it's told like a historical narrative, like a historical narrative. But its point of this fiction, told like a historical narrative, is to teach something that's true, not to teach something that actually happened. For him, the Gospels are full of that kind of story. The easiest way to explain how uh, this works out is to take one uh, example to show how Strauss gives a mythical interpretation to uh, one of the stories of the Gospels. And so I'll take the story of Jesus walking on the water. For Strauss, neither the supernatural nor the natural interpretation makes sense. The way Strauss proceeds throughout this entire book is he goes story by story through the Gospels, taking all of the stories involving these miracles, and he discusses the supernatural explanation to show that the supernatural explanation leaves things unsolved that it can't explain, then shows that the natural explanation is also problematic, which leaves the problem that there, you know, neither one of these ways it works, and so it introduces his way of understanding myth. And so take the walking on the water. The supernaturalist explanation of how the event happened cannot work without denying that Jesus himself had a real human body. Um, because human bodies have more specific gravity, that's the term Strauss uses, human bodies have more specific gravity than water, and therefore they necessarily sink. Humans can't walk on water. Their bodies weigh more than the water they displace. If Jesus, though, did not have a real human body, what does that make him? Well, it means that he's not really a human being. Strauss points out that that is one of the earliest heresies of Christianity, the heresy of docetism. Docetism from the Greek word dakeo, which means to seem or to appear. Uh, that Jesus didn't really have a human body, he only seemed to have a human body. That was the earliest, one of the earliest Christian heresies. Moreover, the supernaturalist explanation has other problems. How is it that Jesus' body doesn't weigh anything? Well, Strauss points out that at an earlier point in Jesus' life, he had no trouble getting under the water. Uh, when he was baptized by John, he was put under the water, and so his body seemed to have specific gravity then. So how does one explain it? Is it that Jesus' body beca uh, begins to weigh less as time goes on, that he began to be less material, uh, more ethereal with the passing of time, so that at the beginning of his life he could go underwater, in the middle of his life he could walk on the water, and at the end of his life he ascends to heaven because he weighs nothing? Well, that seems absurd. Strauss thinks that the whole way of interpreting this is absurd because it has to presuppose that Jesus uh, doesn't have a real body. Or do you want to say that Jesus could suspend his specific gravity by an act of the will, and that Peter could as well? So if Peter didn't want to, his body didn't have to weigh anything. And you could too. So if you didn't want to, you didn't have to weigh anything. So if you believed enough, you could fly like a bird. Well, Strauss doesn't think so. Um, and until I see you zapping through the room, I don't think I believe so either. Strauss thinks that the supernatural explanation doesn't work. But the naturalist explanation of Pallas is scarcely any better. Because Pallas's explanation explains the text by ignoring the text. For example, the Gospels explicitly state that the boat the disciples were in was in the middle of the lake. It doesn't say that the, that the disciples thought it was. Pallas has to, say, has to change what the text says in order to explain what the text means. That doesn't seem like a very safe approach to interpretation. As a result, the supernatural explanation can't explain the text. The natural explanation ignores the text. So what's really going on in this story? According to Strauss, both modes of interpretation err precisely because both of them see the story as a historical event. In fact, 
for Strauss, Jesus walking in the water is not an actual historical event. It's a myth, a history-like story that's trying to convey a truth. Early Christians, Strauss noted, likened the trials and tribulations of this life to a stormy, impetuous sea that threatens life and limb. Who's able to rise above the fears, the hatreds, the enmities of this world? Who can overcome the persecutions, the sufferings, the setbacks of this life? Who can rise above the trials and tribulations of our daily existence? Who can walk upright on the stormy sea? According to this story, Jesus can. For Strauss, the story of the walking on the water was a myth. It's a story meant to reveal the truth about Jesus as the one who can help his followers overcome the obstacles of their lives. In other words, the story is not about something that happened. It's about something that happens. A lot has happened in biblical scholarship since Strauss published his Life of Jesus in 1836. But one thing has remained constant. There continue to be scholars, in fact, for most of the century, it's been the vast majority of critical scholars, who think that he was right, not uh, in all or even most of the specific things that he said, but in the general view that he propounded. There are stories in the Gospels that did not happen historically as narrated, but at, that are meant to convey a truth. Few scholars today would follow Strauss in calling these stories myths. The term is too loaded even still, and for most readers it conveys precisely the wrong connotations. But the idea that the gospel accounts are not 100% accurate, while still important for the religious truths that they try to convey, is widely shared in the scholarly guild, even though it's not so widely uh, known or believed outside of it. The Gospels appear to contain stories that didn't happen as told, which are nonetheless meant to teach a lesson. In the next lecture, I'm going to present evidence that scholars have, uh, have, uh, have which supports this point of view. Before doing so, I should uh, answer a more basic question. Is it possible for a story to be true? if it didn't happen. We certainly don't talk this way normally. When you see a movie, you say, is this a true story? By which you mean, is this a story that actually happened? But we ourselves do tell stories that are, uh, that are meant to convey truths, even though we know that the historical events they narrate didn't occur. The best uh, example of this that I use with my students is the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. As a young boy, George cuts down the cherry tree. Dad comes home, who cut down my cherry tree? George Washington replies, I cannot tell a lie. I did it. We know this story didn't actually happen historically because Parson Weems, who made up the story, uh, told us about it later in his biography of Washington, that he made up the story, which, of course, is one of the ironies, is that uh, I cannot tell a lie is found in a story that was fabricated. Nonetheless, it was fabricated. Why, then, do we tell our kids the story? Possibly, in order to teach something about this great country, Founded on honesty. Who's the father of this nation? George Washington. What kind of man was he? He was an honest man. How honest was he? Well, one time when he was a kid, and you tell the story. Or possibly we tell the story to teach personal lessons in ethics. Don't lie about something even if you've done something wrong. We tell the story because it contains truths that we accept, even though it contains a history that we know was not, uh, not actually uh, accurate. Do the Gospels contain that kind of story? Stories that aren't historically accurate, that contain truths. Well, in the next lecture, we'll look at some of the evidence to suggest that they do. Now let me wrap up this discussion by summarizing its main points. Scholars before the 18th century, like many people still today, almost universally saw the Gospels as historically accurate descriptions of supernatural events. During the Enlightenment, some scholars came to think that the, the Gospels described natural events that were wrongly perceived to be miraculous. Since David Friedrich Strauss, though, many scholars have become convinced that the Gospel contains stories that are not meant to be historical at all, or at least that are not 
historical at all. They are not historical at all, which nonetheless are designed to convey some kind of Christian truth. In our next lecture, we'll begin to see the kinds of evidence that uh, have led scholars to accept this conclusion.